Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Maureen Price, and I will be the moderator for our presentation today. I am the leader for Floor's business transformation and innovation team. We focus on new and innovative ideas, never losing sight of the critical thinking and analysis that comes from our global team of expert engineers and designers. Our people are at the core of our success, and this webinar series is an opportunity to showcase specific expertise or to talk about new trends or code changes that we see. As with the other webinars, this will be a technical presentation specifically for anyone interested in the digitalization strategy of plants with an emphasis on information that may be of use for managers of owner operator companies. Our speaker, Peter Paul Brown, will discuss about the details about Fleur's path to support our clients on their path to a digital future. In this webinar, he will define the digital twin and the basic digital twin architecture, the benefits and challenges of creating a digital twin, and we'll close with a discussion of use cases and how Floor's work supports our client's digital strategy. Peter Paul is a Floor Senior Fellow, trained as a process engineer and an expert in information management. With over 30 years of industry experience, Peter Paul has designed and delivered not just projects for our clients, but also has implemented automation strategies that reliably deliver results at the lowest cost for projects that range from complex mega projects to less complex projects across the various industries that Floor supports. Peter Paul takes a broad look at the entire life project life cycle and considers in his strategy an optimized plan to deal with data management during execution for handover and thereafter. He has been instrumental in developing the integrated engineering data and document systems that Floor uses today. In his time off, Peter Paul likes to travel and plays tennis at a competitive level. Thank you, Maureen. Before I go into the agenda of the webinar, I would like to point out that this webinar fits with two previous sessions held. One was done by Steve Privet on data-minded decision-making in November last year, and the other was done by Ono Paap on ISO 15926, a data exchange standard, in January. These webinars can be found at fluor.com. And for those who missed parts of this webinar or want to listen to it again, you can find a recording on Fluor com as well for this one. So my presentation is split into four parts. First is to set boundaries by giving a definition of the digital twin for me. Then I will go into a couple of use cases because we should not automate just for the sake of automation, but we should have a purpose for automation or creating a digital twin. We also support our clients digital strategy, which is often mentioned or referred to as a digital agenda. And that is very important. And I see many examples at the moment where we engage with our clients to see, okay, what is the digital strategy and how does it fit in our projects? Challenges will be faced. We all know that IT projects are challenging and understanding the challenges and how to overcome them is a key for a successful alignment at the project. And I will finish with a very simple view of the digital twin. And I'll have a few examples on how I look at digital twin and how you can relate that to your own situation. So let's start with a brief history, bit, bit of history. So Fluor has been leading in innovations in our industry and being founded in 1912, we have seen our industry change very often. And we recognize that technology is developing at faster pace in recent years. The picture on the left sure of indicates the situation between 1900 and 1970, where our design was basically done on drawing boards. And they were done on blueprints, or blueprints were created with double mylars and other forms that were creating to transfer information. But all of it was document-based. And we wanted to visualize it also. And then we created in 1951 already the first plastic models. It meant that at Fluor offices, we had full-time model builders because those visualizations became very, very important 
for reviews. For instance, to look at safety, lifting or constructability reviews. These plastic models were slowly replaced by 3D CAD applications. And as you can see on the third picture, we had clunky monitors and the hardware was really, really important, uh, expensive at that time. And we had to go into night shifts to, in order to um, get some money back from the investments. And what you see now as a new technology is 3D printing, which allows you to cre recreate a plastic model again. So that's a full circle back to the old days. And on the right hand side, you see the situation as we have it now, we have two large flat screens. But in future, but it's also partly now, we will go into virtual rooms where people are shown as holograms and models are projected and personalized dashboards are in the background. Obviously with COVID nowadays, we see that virtual rooms are no longer future. We already working virtual rooms. I'm working from home at the moment and I can participate in any review and I can basically do a lot of the work I can did in the office. So these virtual work environments are getting a boost and new business models are being developed. But don't get me wrong, I'm really looking forward to the end of this pandemic so that we can do more human interaction and can resume to normal in a hybrid form of working together, being together and being virtually together. Now I would like to go a little bit more in how I define a digital twin. And I found many ways to describe the digital twin and I wanted to use it to give a little bit of a flavor of what people mean when they say a digital twin. So the first def def definition is about the single point of truth. And this is often used because people really see that a lot of our data is not consistent and that's why people are looking for the single point of truth and don't want to question the quality of the data. This is what I consider the highest level and for that you need your data in top-notch condition. A similar definition is where you have a digital replication of a physical asset. And the key here is the replication and also a replication, it suggests that you have an exact copy. Now, what you will see in many of the examples on digital twins, an exact copy is not always what you need or what you can achieve. So another way to look at it is to put it into three parts. And that is to say, okay, I have three key elements. I have a visualization and that can be a 3D visualization. It can be a dashboard. I have underlying data and that underlying data obviously can have various forms and I have a modeling function and with this modeling function I mean that you can do simulations, what if scenarios and predictions. So you have a user interface, underlying data and then a simulation. It all ends all these definitions together in what you see in the gray. So it is a full set of a portal that you can access data to and can do simulations with. So before I studied these digital twin definitions and looked into it, I was often stuck in the idea of having a 3D portal and looking at a physical location and having an exact replica. But there's another way to look at data as well. So here you can see in the next slide two representations of a digital twin. On the left hand side you have a representation of a plant, the physical part, and that is what I have always pictured myself a digital twin for. But on the right hand side you see a neural representation of the interdependencies of the asset of the same plant. And with this you can quickly zoom into issues and problems on an asset. And you have a complete different way of looking at the same data for a different purpose. So try to look at your portal and your dashboards from different angles and stay away from fixed ideas of a digital twin. 
So after we have aligned on the definition of a digital twin, I would like to talk about the purpose of the digital twin. And with the purpose and use cases, you can justify your investments. Making an investment and getting people excited about digitalization is not difficult at the moment because it's booming, but it's very hard to understand where to start. But you have to identify the purpose and the purpose are identified in these blocks. In order of importance, it is safety. That is the main concern of anybody and every company. And safety, you can really apply, you can look through various scenarios, you can simulate accidents, you can do a lot of things in a digital environment that you cannot do or test in a physical environment. So you have way many more capabilities to address safety. Authority and insurance is also important. The authorities are increasingly expecting that you have your information available at ease, easy and quickly. Nowadays, your license of operate, obviously you have to prove and you, you do prove that you have your information in order, but you, if you have it in digital format, it's easier to do. And the same is true for insurances. You lower your premiums when you can your premiums when you demonstrate that your risks are mitigated. Within environmental, you can, for instance, show how you deal with waste or how you deal with exhaust gases and other things. Again, through simulations and other ways, you can demonstrate more information. Operability and performance. They are often mentioned and they are often referred to as process twins. So you had your physical twin and you have a process twin and your process twin is about how you operate your, organ, your, your plant. So that linking plant automation to improvements and optimizations. Another very important purpose is training. With a digital environment, you can train people into the situation, you can do all kinds of scenarios and you can have people to familiarize themselves with locations without having to be there. You can also link information inside a digital twin. You can link training videos to assets. You can use various virtual reality and augmented uh, technologies also to do more training exercises. The other reason if you have a plant and if you want to make sure your maintenance is well organized, you want to make sure that you have your information ready available and you can get data out of your systems and do your planning and make sure that you are doing preventive maintenance, maybe through some analytics. So on the use cases and benefits that are listed here, they are applicable to both the EPC and the operator owner. And I will give a couple of examples for each of the use cases. So coming back to the single point of truth, this is one interface to information where you do not need to open multiple applications. You want to be presented with the same information from one location. Obviously, if you really want to achieve the single point of truth, your underlying data should not have conflicts. And even if your underlying data have conflicts, then at least you know that you may have a problem. The other use case, which we see technology helping a lot, is collaboration. And as an example, we see in the industry of building, we see building information modeling. And that was put together because there were multiple companies working in the same physical locations. And the technology is now allowing various companies using their own tools, sending a model to a common environment and make sure that you do not get to the same location with two uh, persons, two, two companies, because you can only occupy a coordinate one time. Diagnostics is also very helpful in digital twin use cases. 
within Fluor, we have set up a program that's the EPC, Project Health Diagnostics, EPHD, which is an IBM Watson-based platform which objectively monitor project health. It collects data from projects and perform data analytics on project control data and live project systems. It analyzes the data and compares it to historical data using machine learning techniques. So here you see an example where Fluor applied digital twin technology in, in their work. Predictive maintenance is often used in a lot of the seminars I see about how you have very complex systems and through machine learning and big data collection, you can really make sure that your complex systems like compressors are maintained before they break, because if they break, the consequences are very big. While our industry has always been very document driven, we are making a shift to data. We are storing information in databases and we're maintaining data in databases. With that, we have the opportunity to do data analysis, analysis and other good things with the data. On the documents, we often are stuck with the documents not being able to really extract data from. The data quality is something that you will have to address as well. And you need to define not only to make sure that your quality of your data is good, but you also have to assign maturity to it, which is especially important for Fluor in the case that we are designing and building because information is created while we do design build. And knowing the status is extremely important. And the status in the past was always given by the status of a document. And now we have to try and get into an organizational mode that the data is status at data level and not only at document level. Some other use cases are augmented reality. Once you have a 3D model, and you have information about the location, you can really put new information on top of it. And there are various ways of applying augmented reality once you, once you have a, a model in your hands. And another big case for digital twin is the remote support. Again, the pandemic has shown that it is very important that people can work at any location from any place in the world to get to the data. And you can really get good benefits if you, get, if you, if you have experts available uh, at all time and you do not only have to rely on your local uh, persons. So now let's look at the digital twin as we develop it in the life cycle of a plant. On the left hand side, you'll see EPC activities and that is to create a digital twin. This is in case, obviously, when you have a new plant. And in principle, the systems that are used by the EPC contractor are optimized to support design build. On the right hand, you see the various activities op operations and the cases that are being used for our operator owners to use a digital twin. And in order for the operator owners to have a useful digital twin, some elements need to be added to the EPC's digital twin to be effective. And in particular, agreements need to be made for vendor data. In our current work process, vendors are, provided data, are providing data via documents, and the EPC contractor is focusing on collecting those data that are needed for their own design build, for their ISO creation, and material controls. So special attention is needed what vendor data is to be put into the digital twin, for instance, for maintenance activities. Because if you do not define that, you will not have it. In the middle, you see this digital twin visualized again as a physical asset. And what I want to show with this is that 
the digital twin is really helping our construction and commissioning team. So we want them to be very uh, effective in the plant and have the information on how it's going to be look like in, uh, already while they're building. So let's switch gears and talk about underlying technologies. In our investor strategy briefing end of January, Industry 4.0 and Digital Twin were highlighted by our CEO, David Constable, and other group presidents. And Industry 4.0 originated in Germany in 2006, but in parallel it was coming up in other parts of the world, say Japan and USA, since it was all based on technology being available. The Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution was just a name which was put on it in Europe. And it is a combination of capabilities and cost. Our hardware costs are dropping in big way. You get a lot more for storage, bandwidth or computing power for the same amount of money. And that continues to be so. Storage is no longer a big problem. Bandwidth, we can all work at different locations. And also the computing power we see trends that we also have quantum computers. Another element is the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is developing to have higher bandwidth available at all locations, and it can be either through telecom networks for 5Gs or with Wi-Fi networks uh, put together at remote sites as we sometimes do on our mining facilities. Technologies underlying the digital twin are cloud computing. Cloud computing is really getting accepted more and more, and the safety aspect was important, but is being addressed. And many of our cloud computing services are now compliant to the ISO 27000 series, and it allows collaboration and data storage. Big data and segmented web technologies help with data integration and artificial intelligence and machine learning help with analysis. And while in my early years, automation, most of the advancements, we were digitalizing our paperwork processes. We had, didn't see any major changes in the way we've done our work. We changed to use computers and we work shared with other companies and we work shared with uh, our execution centers in India and the Philippines. What I do see is that industry 4.0 is going to be a different way of looking at our work processes and it can be disruptive to our existing structures. An example is that now if I want to get a smoke detector, I may buy a Google smoke detector because the hardware is not interesting. I'm interested in the software that comes with it, that I get an alarm on my phone, which I have on, my, on me anytime. So it doesn't matter in what room I am, if there is a smoke detected in my house, I'm alarmed and I know that I have a problem. So how does Fluor apply a digital twin? So internally, we have created a system around data-centric execution. We have defined standards because we want conformity of data. Obviously, we would like to have standards to be used that are available as industry standards, but that is still not there. So we have thought and also looked at, okay, what are the standards that we have ourselves? And let's start from there. And our data, is quality controlled with data governance and stewardship. So this is how we maintain the data. And having a standard across our projects allows for automation. We do not have one offs per project. So this data governance and stewardship, again, I need to stress is to maintain the environment. When you have digital twin, you need to make sure you have a process 
to maintain it. So Fluor is strong in engineering data management because that's our core business. So let's look at how engineering data management supports the digital twin and how it is used as a data source. Next slide. In the middle of the circles, you see data standards, and these data standards are owned by engineering. And they, information and this data is received by various disciplines. And then in the outer circle, you see the various use cases. The purpose of this slide is to make sure that when you look into a digital twin application, that you have a good view of your underlying data. And having good control of the underlying data will increase the possibilities of a digital twin. And then you can get to this reference of single point of truth. So the single point of truth comes with a very well data centric execution and control of your data. What we see in the market is that information management is becoming more and more important when we get big new projects. And we see a digital strategy being defined by our clients and for the plant. And in some cases, we are being asked to help in defining the digital strategy as part of the feed package or even the EPC package, because sometimes our clients don't have the digital plans fully ready when they start a the design of a plant. In the market, some software vendors, maybe 3D vendors, are convincing the industry that EPC contractors are already using design systems. And therefore, if you just transfer those design systems, you would have a digital twin. Well, unfortunately, it is a little bit more complex. complex. Alignment is really important. And the digital twin should be part of the digital strategy of the plant. And you need to share that strategy with the EPC contractor because you have to get to it with it together. So in the invitations to bid, we see often requirements about data consistency. And with data consistency, I mean that the data is the same across systems. which is important if you want to get to the single point of truth. Also data maturity. So what is the status? What is currently related to information on documents, like status is issued for design or issued for construction or is as built, that maturity need to be addressed to the data. And finally, data conformity. Every project or every client will have a set of rules to what data needs to be tagged. And these tag numbers, for instance, are very important in your conformity because they will be the basis for any linking to the various systems. When you have an existing plant, there are various levels of digitalizations that you can apply. And in the very base cases, you could already do some digital twin activities with a laser scan, you can already go through the plant and you can also look at some safety hazards or other things with just a laser scan. But often that is not what you after, you want like more. So you can add to it a 3D model. And in this 3D model, you already have your scan, but you define your tax. And what we see in the market that for existing facilities, is what I call a light 3D application where you can navigate and mark up at the site is really going to add value and have already the first elements of the digital twin. So once you have your model and tags, you can add other information to it. And the first elements to add to it are the asset information. So you combine it to an asset management register or a tech register, and then you can also relate documents to it. So if you have a relation between a tech and a document, you can easily, through hyperlinking or other technologies, pull up the document while you are at the interface. 
but you even want to go further and put engineering to towards engineering data and that are attributes and design information that is collected during engineering and that may be of use for certain use cases next level would be to add operational data there's lots of sensors dcs data that you can then apply and then you get into this picture that is often shown as a full digital twin because then you get to the ultimate level where you have the simulation attached to it and with the simulation you'll be able to run what if scenarios or cases or can do a whole lot of things with your digital twin okay now i come to the third part which is about the challenges we've had conversations with several clients about digitalization strategy and development of digital twins and what we've seen is that a digital twin is always part of a digital strategy and that is the core of what i wanted to show here first you will need to look at the, your systems and applications and you have to decide whether you want to look at it from an enterprise level or more on the plant level. So often our discuss discussions are centered around the tools that we are using. And ideally we would use tools or we would use data and be tools agnostic, but we're not there yet. So we have had the question already a couple of times, not only about the tools, but also on data. Can we design and build a plant and operate without documents? And I guess in theory we can, in reality, we have to probably take a few more steps. So some of our clients will demand certain tools to be used and we see an increased number of clients that are hosting tools. And this has two advantages from their point of view. One is that they are in full control of the format of the handover. In the past, we have seen many cases where the format of the data at handover is not in the format that is required for the digital strategy or for the digital twin. The other advantage is that information is available at all stages of the project and is often put and phrased as transparency. The disadvantage is that the EPC contractor will have to make various adaptions to the work process and interfaces for each and every client that they serve and what i see in practice i see waves i see sometimes i see the clients moving into the direction where they dictate a lot and then where there is more of a freedom and this is something that has to do with the strategy that is being developed the data model that is always a client specific element and what we are looking at at the moment is various ways to map between the various data models and ideally we would like to have some interoperability with data exchange and Onopap already mentioned that in his ISO 59 to 6 presentation. Another thing that we see coming up is collaboration. So in general we see collaboration and technologies helping to work together with the various tools. If you, if, if you have a digital strategy and you are looking at, okay, how does my digital twin look like? There are a couple of challenges and these challenges are not specific for operator owner. They are for everybody, but I thought it was important to list them all because it is difficult to create business cases. Quite often you find applications and things to do while you're exploring your ways. So what we see, and that from the examples I gave within Fluor, we started somewhere and then we saw more opportunities. But let's go through the challenges we will all see in the digital twin. And the first one is cybersecurity. All companies will have one or another form of data governance and IT governance, 
And that is important because that makes sure that information is handled in a secure way. An other element that we see is IP protection and data privacy rules, which are dictated maybe through the rules, maybe through uh, authorities, and maybe through companies. So security is getting very important. The lack of standardization should not stop us. The example I gave on the data-centric execution is an internal start where we have just started to get data in a good format and we will move to industry standards when they become available. The uncertainty in scope and focus, if you make your projects too big to fail or too small to be insignificant, you're not able to be any successful. So think about what the scope you're going to put together and have a focus on it. And that is supported through commitment and strategy. The commitment is the key. It is make sure that everybody understands why this digital twin is going to help the organization. And also the sense of urgency is very important because we do see that there is going to be disruption on the market for this. Maintenance, again, if you do not make sure that you maintain your twin, it is useless. When you build a house, you should also maintain it. Otherwise it will break down and can no longer be used. And digital twins are best maintained by the asset managers at the site because they then have to be responsible for the physical and the digital elements. For platforms and tools, I often get the question, what do you recommend? And this is very tricky because we don't know what future brings and we cannot guarantee that anything that we apply at the moment will last for 10 years. Technology is moving and is changing very fast. So try to be flexible and try to be adaptive. And finally, user acceptance. In the beginning of digitalization at many of the seminars and conferences, user acceptance was very high on the list and we needed digital change uh, officers and, 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 and organizational change management. But in practice, we have seen that people are now demanding technology like they have in their own daily life. They are collaborative through various platforms, social media, they have a mobile or a tablet, and they, are, they expect from the companies to have the same fu functionality of the, with the tools that are being provided by the companies. Okay. With this picture, with the digital twin architecture, it is a really, really simplified picture of a digital twin and you can put that on the table if you start a discussion about the digital twin. And it consists of the three layers I mentioned before. So at the basis, you have your data and the data should remain in source systems. And the sources are shown here as engineering design applications, documents, operational data, maintenance data, and then the last bit is about the simulation. That is that third element that you require to make it truly a digital twin. This information needs to be integrated. But when I talk about integration, I don't mean that data is integrated between these applications, but it is an integration layer which holds the master data and holds the data from the various applications. And often, for performance reasons, this integration layer is also storing the data because it's a copy from the source. And this is just done for technical reasons that you can only look at the data. So it's read only data and they're also occasionally named operational data storages. Modifications should always be made at the source level data. And the visualization layer is then the portal and the portal can 
be various ways, as I explained. It can be a 3D model. It can be a dashboard. It can be a neural uh, representation, anything. It's a visualization layer. If you apply this architecture to your discussions, you will discover that you can use it as a talking picture. So let's finish with some takeaways. So the EPC digital twin is not by definition the same as the operator digital twin. Some parts are, but not everything. So it's very important that you align on this and you understand what is required to match it and to have it the same, or at least to apply and match the operator requirements. Just go and make small steps. Don't try to get everything together, but keep the end in mind. Make it part of your strategy. Within Fluor, we have developed various elements of the digital twin for our own purposes, and we've done it in steps, and we are continuously growing. For existing facilities, there are various options, like I mentioned, and you need to look into that also taking into consideration how long will your plant stay in operation or is your plant going to be used for a very different purpose. And as I had the fortune to work for and with various business lines or industries within Fluor, many elements of the digital twin were technology. Sorry. Many, I, I saw many applications, for instance, in the infrastructure that I worked, I saw a lot of things that be used for the high-speed rail link project. And also we leverage a lot from automotive and we leverage, leverage from mining and other industries. We should learn from each other. But at the end, get going. It is your future. Fluor is ready and I hope you are ready. So let's join forces and be successful. With that, I would like to give the word back to Maureen. Thank you very much, Peter Paul. We do have a handful of questions that have come in, but I do want to encourage our audience to please make use of the Q&A tab and to submit more questions. We, we have about 10 minutes for questions and uh, we want to be able to answer um, everything that's in your mind, but hasn't yet been been typed in. So, so the 1st question, Peter Paul is at what point do you see the digital twin development start? As you look at the overall project life cycle. Where, where do you think we should start? So we should start at the uh, the feed uh, level. So at the at the fee uh, the, or even at FEL when we when we start defining the project. And like I said, I see already in these these packages now questions where we are being asked to help to develop that digital twin for uh, final use. So we already start developing it for our own purposes. So we have dashboards and other things that we create and we are looking for ways. One other thing which is important when we do this, these projects is that we have a strategy on the data execution so that we make sure that we align information towards each other. Within Fluor, one of the strategies that we have is that we design in accordance with a certain construction sequence and we develop construction work packages. And these construction work packages need to de be defined early in the program so that we can align everything around that. So that's an example of not waiting for the phase of construction, but make sure that in the phases before construction, you're already be prepared with your data to, to meet those requirements later. Great answer. All right, here's another one. In terms of payback on the investment to create a digital twin from for an existing plant, which doesn't have scope for of improvement and change, things of that nature, right? So applying it to an existing facility, is it still viable or 
um, for any changes done. Um, should any changes be done? I'm trying to figure out how to reword this. Um, during a brownfield modification, um, what should we do differently during a brownfield job, you know, to be able to facilitate this digital twin? Yeah, so for brownfield projects, we, uh, and regardless how long the project will, or the plant will stay, what we typically see is that uh, scans, laser scans are made, and that is very common. So these laser scans will then be the basis for, for, for modifications, but you can then also use those scans for some other purposes. So the idea is that you do not only uh, use information for one purpose, but you also use it for other purposes. And you do not need to have that full picture of the digital plant or the digital twin, but just look at what elements do you want to uh, address. And what I see now, I see some opportunities where in a brownfield modification, what you, what you see is that if you have the laser scan and if you make that in that basic 3D model and maybe put some asset and documents, just go through the third level on this picture, then you do not need to go any further and you already have a, a lot of value. And then for the modifications itself in the brownfield, you will still use your design systems, but that will be then only specific for your design system. If you would have an overall strategy that you would like to get your full plant into higher level of digital twin, then you can think of making that design information then available for that, for those plant modifications in a more digital format. But that means that you would then have a hybrid. You will not have all the design information of your entire, entire plant in the twin, but you will have that information of the modifications. So yes, uh, money is very tight at uh, existing plants, I, I, I understand. Right, but but what you're saying is that clients are willing to invest to to go down this path even on existing facilities. Well, what I'm what I'm trying to say, you don't have to go through the full length. You can you can you can, you can pick and choose. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question: Do you believe that a digital twin is an inevitability for all projects in the future, or are there particular a particular niche area that the digital twins are meant to fill? So what I what I see that for all new facilities a digital twin will be there. There, there there's no doubt because more and more information is uh, digitally available. So for for any new facility, uh, it's in effort, it, it will be the, will be there. So um, but it does it it, it varies from uh, in forms. Uh, did that answer your question, Maureen? Because I think so. I okay. think so. It did. All right. So the questions are piling in. So get ready. Um, do you see a lot of requests for the digital twin in the current ITBs, or do you see clients hesitating because of uncertainties on the cost benefit analysis? No, I see it uh, in every uh, ITB for new uh, projects. It's maybe not mentioned or named a digital twin. But I see the information requirements uh, defined, and um, I don't think it will. It does not need to be a very high uh, or a, a big uh, add-on to the cost. Uh, one of the things that I try to get within my own organization is that digitalization should be a help to do your work better and maybe give opportunities to do things differently. And what is always what is very interesting is to see how we could make that happen. Um, we serve our construction organization, and quite often they are really if if the information that is from engineering provided really supports the construction, like I mentioned on on construction work packages, that is really helping in doing the construction and commissioning uh, in a more effective way. The commissioning and turnover, uh, we see many opportunities to uh, enter the data from engineering into our uh, our MC Plus, which is, which is our turnover system. And we see uh, opportunities to link uh, document systems uh, to that as well. So there's, there's many ways 
uh, within the organization where, where we see this, uh, this happening. All right. Um, great. Here's another question. What kind of efficiency improvement can we expect in effort hours, the cost or schedule of a project using a digital twin? Um, yeah, so, so. What tough are, question. What, no, no, well, the tough, the, 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 the tough, the tough question is, is that, that it, the, because. To date, digitalization has not led to uh, a huge uh, cost saver. So we 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 have this paradox where, and I I always compare it to in the old days, as you mentioned, I I used to be a process engineer, where when I started, uh, process simulations came up, and the comment of the experts was, well, all these computers they don't help us at all. Because they have given us so many options and so many ways to compute and 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 to look at different scenarios. In the old days, it was all done on on a piece of paper, and you were not allowed to make mistakes. So you thought three times uh, before you made a simulation. And now you 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 run twenty simulations and 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 just uh, pick the best. Or even people will say, well, not. Uh, uh, let's have some artificial intelligence running simulations and let them pick the best solution and just uh, calculate uh, 20,000, uh, I don't know what the number, but a lot of simulations and, 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 and not have the, the, the judgment uh, on it, but let the computer decide. So that is, that is difficult to, to, to see. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the paper-based work process we have digitalized and we have made it more complex in the, the work share with various organizations and locations. And that really, it helped in the man-hour rates down, so the cost, but it didn't really put a lot of efficiency and, and, and lower man-hours. So, um, difficult answer. Um, I am convinced that we will uh, and, and, and that just from a holistic point of view, if you have your data and if you look at the opportunities and you already see it happening, then you, you, you see so much more can be done. The, the difficulty is, is to select the elements that you, you want to have done because with more capabilities, people are also tending to do more than may be necessary. Exactly, exactly. All right, here's another question. How do you see a possible division of responsibility between a platform application vendor and floor? Uh, well, division of responsibility for a platform vendor, I would, I would say the platform vendor would be responsible for the availability of the platform and uh, elements like security and access control and, and if the platform also provides uh, an application uh, services to make sure that 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 that's running, uh, Fluor will always be responsible for the content. So um, the so the platform organization will will never take ownership of 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 the engineering data and the content. That will always stay with Fluor. All right, very good. I think we have time for for one last question, maybe two, depending on how how quick the responses are. Are you using a digital twin on a current project today? Yes, and uh, like I said, I can uh, uh, declare everything a digital twin in the way I can play with definitions. But uh, uh, jokingly aside, uh, we have all of our plans. We have a three D environment. We have mining uh, projects where we have. Uh, really demonstrated uh, a fully integrated 3D system with a, uh, a smart plan foundation uh, associated with it. So we, yeah, we have uh, many examples. We are introducing uh, a lot of the reporting. We have a, a, a big program to make sure that we are able to dashboard and report data from various sources uh, and 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 make it really visible. So uh, those those are uh, real examples of uh, of digital twin uh, applications on our projects. All right, 
Very good. I think that's probably there. There's, I don't know, probably 30 more questions, but I think you'll be able to answer those after the fact and no, we'll send them I'll, out I'll, in, the, in the Q and A. I have something to do tonight. <laughs> so, um, but, but time is up, so we don't have any more time for live Q and A, but I do want to thank you, Peter, Paul, for the time that you spent today and in preparation for this. I also want to say thank you to our audience for attending. They've been very engaged and it's been a pleasure being the moderator. So we will be hosting our next webinar on Thursday, February 25th at 9 a.m. Central, where subject matter experts Burju Ekmeki and Josh Lawrence will be talking about Floor's integrated water solutions. Burju and Josh will be exploring how water reuse and recovery strategies can be identified and incorporated for clients' new and existing facilities. This approach helps clients achieve greater water sustainability by reducing stress on local water resources, minimizing effluent discharge, and optimizing overall life cycle costs. Please keep in touch with your floor contacts, follow our social media postings, or head to the Innovation Builders page on floor.com to register for this or other future webinars. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for dialing in. We will, <clears throat> we will send out a compiled list of the Q&As within a few days, along with the notification that the webinar recording is available on floor.com. If you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back with you. From all of us on the Innovation Builders team, have a safe day.